my class of 100 students, there were six women. At the end of the day, I only had uh, three interviews, one of them in Clearwater, where the senior partner just sat me down and said, little lady, I see that you're married, you need to go home and have a family. You all heard the story during the 70s, it was look to your right, look to your left. This was at any law school, one of you would not be here, but our contracts professor said, and if you're black, both of you will be gone. In spite of all of the strides that have been made, there is still much to be done. Somebody had their finger on the scale and was deciding in advance of the exam that only two blacks were going to pass it, no matter how many took it. Francisco Rodriguez, Warren Dawson, uh, Delano Stewart, George Edgecombe, if you wanted to have lunch because your case had recessed, the closest that you could go would be over to Central Avenue where there were black restaurants. The restaurants in the downtown area were segregated and that was not uh, permitted. And of course, today's main courthouse is the George Edgecombe. My name is Warren Hope Dawson, and I am originally from Mulberry, Florida, over in Polk County. As you journey uh, east on uh, Highway 60 and cross out of Hillsborough into Polk County, the first uh, metropolis that you come into is a little phosphate mining town called Mulberry, and that's where I'm from originally. My full name is Emiliano Jose Salcinas. They call me EJ, and I have been an, an attorney now 49 years, soon starting my 50th year of licensure in Florida. I became an attorney the week before Kennedy was assassinated. I became an attorney being sworn in in the Florida Supreme Court, November 15, 1963. I grew up in Macon, Georgia. Um, I'm, I was born in Atlanta. I'm the daughter of a Baptist preacher and um, a nurse. I have three brothers. I'm the only girl in the family. My name is William Ray Smith, Jr. I was born in Athens, Tennessee, which is halfway between Chattanooga and Knoxville. My parents, however, moved me to Plant City, Florida when I was three months old. Well, I'm Don Castor. And, uh... I was born and reared in Tampa. Um, I was born in 1931 in the middle of the Depression and reared in Seminole Heights, uh, uh, half a block north of Hillsborough High School. I'm Del Stewart, uh, Delano uh, S. Stewart, that S is for smart. My parents were optimistic as well as they were truly prophetic, but that's it, Delano Smart Stewart. Well, I was born in North Carolina and my father had come to Tampa to do a residency in OBGYN at Tampa General Hospital, so we moved here when I was five years old. So I basically have lived and gone to school in Tampa all of my life. The National Labor Relations Board would hire me uh, to work for the NLRB in Tampa, making me, my, uh, me the first black person to work for the NLRB as a lawyer in the South, along with a classmate of mine who went to Memphis, Tennessee. But the decision to hire was done in Washington. It was thought that the regional director for the Tampa office, and Tampa was a regional office of the NLRB, uh, it was thought that it was best that the hiring decision be made in Washington rather than by the uh, a regional director in Tampa to keep uh, the pressure, the local pressure, off of him. When I uh, became the first black public defender, and Joe and a guy and his dad that were talking, and I said, well, I will be the public defender, but I will not be a black. He said, well, what do you mean you won't be black? I said, I will not just represent black people. If I'm coming, you put it on a rotational basis, 
I understand the Constitution. I made 98 at Howard Law School, which is the capstone of constitutional law. And what I'm saying that a person has an absolute Sixth Amendment right to reject me, and I'm not uh, thin-skinned, and if he said, nigga, I don't want you to represent me, I move to the next person. And that's the way it'll be, or I won't come. They looked at, they are, they were odd, so they put me in appeals. <laughs> 1963, I became city attorney, and about the same time, president of the Hillsborough County Bar Association. Uh, that's when, as city attorney, I hired the first black in the legal department, one Warren Dawson. Uh, Reese Smith uh, and then uh, young Dick Greco, the mayor, uh, hired me as the first assistant city attorney. And in so doing, this is early 1967, and in so doing, I became the first black person to be an assistant city attorney for any city in the South. If you were to ask me what I thought my experience as a black lawyer at Trenton was different than my white colleagues, I would answer yes. You have to remember that I was the first black lawyer hired by the firm. And so my experience there was unlike any other any lawyer had there, um, both from my perspective and from the firm's perspective. And so I think there were probably issues there in terms of you know, how does this lawyer get assimilated into the firm? I think that there may have been some issues in terms of, you know, how do we introduce this lawyer to our clients? I think there may have been issues in terms of a uh, lawyer's sense of ease with uh, working with me um, and also maybe um, lawyers' concerns about, you know, how clients react to working with me. In 1964, uh, then Attorney General Robert Kennedy appointed me as an assistant United States attorney, and as it turned out, I was the first Spanish-speaking assistant U.S. attorney east of the Mississippi. When I was looking for a job, I, I you know, I can remember one example of going to uh, one of uh, my dad's friends who had a very successful small firm and uh, he essentially said I, he thought I needed to go be a law clerk like Stella Thayer had been, that that was the kind of thing that women ought to be doing, you know, appellate work and uh, office work, not, uh, not litigation. And so, as I say, I did experience and did see some discrimination in hiring. I, I, I was very lucky when I went into private practice to be with a firm that I think is very much a meritocracy. At the time I was appointed to be a United States magistrate judge, there had never been an African-American female in the federal court in the state of Florida. There had been males who had served as both magistrate judges and there were sitting district judges who were males, who were African-American, but there were no females. Um, there were only two African-American females serving in the federal courts in the entire 11th Circuit myself and a judge named Judge Vanzetta McPherson, who was in Alabama. We were the only two African-American females in the federal courts in the 11th Circuit. And then eventually I was appointed in 2008 to be a United States District Judge here in the Middle District of Florida, becoming only the second African-American female in the 11th Circuit to attain that uh, position. I was not focused on being um, anything other than the, uh, the best president bars ever had. Now, obviously, for a lot of people, me being the first black president was uh, significant. But um, I saw my role as you know, being the best president the bars ever had. We, um, we broke ground on uh, the bar center the year I was president of the bar. And so I think that is probably the most tangible thing that occurred in my year as president of the bar. But on the issue of pride, I am very proud that I was the first African American president of the Bar Association. And I think we had a, a wonderful year. I think we had uh, very good programs that year. And um, 
I think, as I look back, I just have very fond memories. And so I hope that by uh, my year of service, um, you know, my colleagues, you know, saw that an African-American lawyer can do as well or better job as any of the lawyer in the Bar Association. Commissioned as an officer in the Army and did a, had unusual duty because of the times. If you watch uh, TV now and you see the Freedom Rides, the bus rides, that's the year I graduated from high school, I mean from, uh, from college. Uh, and I was an officer in the Army, kind of dealing from the military perspective with some of that activity. So much of uh, my military involvement had to do with problems we were having with race. Uh, when James Meredith was ordered to be allowed to enter the University of Mississippi, uh, I carried a unit of military uh, army guys uh, into Mississippi on the outskirts of where the University of Mississippi is located just to be safe, uh, so to speak, for uh, James Meredith, who became the first uh, black student ordered admitted uh, to the University of Mississippi. My first experience in uh, discrimination was in the seventh grade coming to the Hillsborough County Courthouse to get my little badge as a junior deputy. After getting it in the sheriff's office, I went up to the second floor of the old Hillsborough County Courthouse, what we call the Minaret Courthouse, and looked through the porthole windows that they had there and saw that a trial was in, 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 in session. And I went directly into the court and sat immediately to the left, the very first uh, pew next to the door. Uh, shortly thereafter, a gentleman that uh, today I would say was the bailiff of that court came over and put his hand on my shoulder and said, sit on the other side, you're sitting on the nigger side. I can recall an incident, an incident once where I was um, stopped on campus just walking from um, west campus to central campus and I was stopped by an officer, he called for backup, I guess I call it, and eventually I was uh, pinned in on a sidewalk by four campus police officers by their patrol cars. Wanted to know where I had been, where I was going, what I was doing on campus, those kinds of things. And of course, I was just a uh, student walking my own campus apartment. And this whole story of uh of segregation, all one of the outstanding heroes is Cody Fowler during the 1970s. He was wonderful because of the fact he took a leadership role in in uh, trying to calm the waters when when the, the burnings were going on on Central Avenue. Uh, Cody stepped up and and tried to mediate the whole uh, uh, vo volatile situation and did a good job and and uh, keeping more damage uh, done than what's done. Uh, leaders of the state of Florida, leaders here in Tampa, refuse to want to accept what the Brown versus Board of Education decision was about. Uh, the governor of Florida said that he could not support it. Uh, the chief judges around here were, um, were, in fact, the Hillsborough Bar Association had a significant meeting on uh, what to do about this decision. 1954, the Hillsborough Bar Association was arguing, what should we do uh, besides impeaching Earl Warren not to comply with what the Supreme Court unanimously had said? When Brown was decided, I was a freshman in college, and Kenneth Rogers, who I joined in law practice, was a senior in law school. He had a, a roommate from Costa Rica who daddy had a coffee plantation and I have been looking for that taste in coffee ever since. And I'll say it because what a dynamic decision and how it was going to impact America. And then, you know, then in 72, Judge Crenshman appoints me to be on the board to integrate the schools in Hillsborough County. So therefore, deliberate speed changes in the true meaning. Uh, in your deep moments, you say, how can these people be sincere 
about justice when they do everything to thwart justice. I guess I'd been in, in, in the practice five years. Leroy Collins was governor of Florida. And uh, he asked me to come up to be his legislative aide. And these were the days in which uh, you had uh, the segregationists dominating Georgia, Arkansas, Alabama, and then we had Florida with Leroy Collins. And uh, Roy was a moderate, and uh, he was someone that I was very close to, and we had a great relationship. And one of the keys was that the, the Florida legislature was dominated by what we call the, the pork chop gang. And uh, they were mostly segregationist, and they passed what was called the interposition resolution, which was to interpose Florida law between what the, the federal government had done and was what was being done. And Roy got the, got the resolution, you cannot, you cannot veto resolutions. And uh, he didn't, we, we huddled, we didn't know what we were gonna do with the resolution. And we argued over it, he said, but I want all of, I said, I've got so much of a program to pass. And we argued back and forth, I remember that vividly. And finally he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, I'll write, here I choke up because it was so emotional. Uh, he said, I will write on the resolution. And he did, he said, he said to the people, I cannot veto this, but I want you to know it's wrong and I'm against it. And he put it in and that was flying in the face of the Florida legislature. But it, it set the tone of what Florida would do in the segregation issue. When I took the bar exam, uh, in 1906, Florida bar exam uh, in 1966 and 1967, uh, it came to the attention of uh, those of us who were black that there somehow had been a significant coincidence that was occurring, i.e. that for each sitting of the bar exam, which was twice a year, that only two blacks were passing the exam no matter how many took it. And that went on, uh, as we best estimate, for a rough period of about 10 years, probably measured from about 1962 or three up until maybe 71 or two. The Bar Association um, sponsored the, the State Bar, Board of Bar Examiners gave two exams a year. They were always given at the DuPont Plaza Hotel in Miami. I believe it was Brickell or, or Biscayne uh, Boulevard in Miami. So those that took the bar exam had to stay in either black rooming houses or some hotel somewhere. They could not take their breakfast in the, in the cafeteria or the cafe of the DuPont Plaza they uh, were not permitted because that was for whites only. They built a new courthouse in Tampa, Florida in 1952-53, and it had segregated facilities, segregated water fountains, segregated restrooms, and there was specialized courtroom seating so that blacks sat in the back on the back two benches in any courtroom. It ultimately became necessary for higher level appellate courts to require that uh, judges and prosecutors and lawyers and others address black people as Mr. or Mrs. rather than uh, Fanny, uh, what'd you say Fanny? Say that again. Uh, they, not, they would not even dignify black uh, witnesses and the like with a Mr. or Ms., but rather call them by their first names. I was appointed as an assistant state attorney in the Hillsborough County Courthouse, which is now the building that is occupied by state attorney Mark Ober. That was the only courthouse building that we had. That was before the annex and before the George Edgecombe building, etc. And uh, in there, 
there were separate facilities. For instance, bathrooms for the whites and bathrooms for the colored. We didn't use the word black then, but the word colored was the word that was most commonly used. And the water fountains were significant because the refrigerated uh, water fountains said whites only. The spigot said colored. There were very few that I remember, hardly no blacks on jury duty, and very, very few women on jury duty. We did not have black uh, detectives. We did not have black investigators. Um, we did not have any black bailiffs. We did not have black court reporters or personnel in the courthouse. That came years later. Well, it was, wasn't hard to note the absence of blacks in the legal community in Tampa. There were practically none. In my day, the first one of, that I came to be aware of was Francisco Rodriguez. He, however, could not be a member of the Hillsborough County Bar Association. Uh, the bylaws simply did not make provision for uh, African Americans. That didn't get changed until I was president of the Hillsborough County Bar Association. The, uh, Judge Castor was talking about several of the black lawyers in Edgecombe. There was a, a, a black Jamaican lawyer by the name of Francisco Rodriguez who was fun to have come before you because he was so flamboyant. And uh, it was, uh, that, that was about the only one I had, I think. I followed uh, James Sandlin as lead counsel uh, in the school desegregation case uh, in uh, Hillsborough County. Uh, that case was known as Manning versus the school board. Uh, uh, you may or may not know that he, uh, the Hillsborough County School District happens to be one of the largest school districts uh, in the United States. Uh, and the case was, as I say, Manning versus the school board. And uh, for 27 years, I was lead counsel in that case. 27 years attempting to call, to bring about an equal education opportunity uh, for, uh, for all of the kids in the public schools of Hillsborough County, Florida. On integration, I was a uh, candidate for the federal judgeship. And I didn't get it. Judge Krenzman got it, fortunately. And he was in charge of the school system, you know, in Hillsborough County. And uh, it, uh, the, the, the case was brought to integrate. Nothing happened. And finally, after the Mecklenburg decision of the Supreme Court, he called the lawyers in, and one day he he eliminated segregation in the schools of Hillsborough County. He said there will be no more black schools. Everything will be integrated. And that was a very gutsy decision. There's one I haven't gotten to yet. Uh, which had to do with my dear friend Warren Dawson. I mean that. We're, we're good friends. Uh, but he had represented the Legal Defense Fund of the National, of the NAACP locally for a long time, having to do with the desegregation of the public schools in Hillsborough County. And Judge Ben Krenzman, federal judge, had entered an order of oversight of that was in effect in quite a long time in the public, in the course of desegregating the public schools. That started in the 1960s, at least from, that's when the initial decision was rendered, and it was in the 70s, I think, that we got the schools integrated here in Hillsborough County. I had a law partner who 
Marvin Green was his name, who was then chair of the school board. And he took a leading part in helping desegregate the schools. Of course, it was quite controversial. But when we got into the early 1990s, those who had been active in getting the schools desegregated and so forth had never sought attorney's fees as they could have and costs uh, for the work that was being done. And so they asked their local lawyer, Dawson, to try to get some money for them. By that time, Judge Kovakovich had entered an order which pretty much stopped the thing. But we appealed it, got a reversal, and before it was over with, got several hundred thousand dollars. I can't, I think it was 400, but I'm not sure. Uh, for the Legal Defense Fund and the NAACP. The school system may not be all that it can be uh, for our children, but at least it is all that it can be for all of our children on an equal basis. Uh, and that, uh, we think, made a difference. Uh, the idea of having uh, uh, textbooks for, for black children that were passed down from, from, uh, 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 from white schools uh, and that kind of thing, or having uh, uh, chemistry labs with no test tubes uh, uh, or inferior, uh, the so-called separate but equal things certainly just never did work. Uh, and so to, to have desegregated, fully desegregated over the years, and I might say in that regard that uh, the school district of Hillsborough County was not exactly one of the, might you say, uh, dis school districts that was imaginative in its willingness to comply. Uh, it, instead, uh, it, uh, in many instances, tried to find every way not to comply in the early days. Uh, it was recalcitrant, reluctant uh, to comply, indeed, causing uh, the judge who spent maybe the most time in it, uh, federal judge Ben Krinsman, who finally, uh, uh, in exasperation, suggested to the Hillsborough County School District that it might just look around itself at not at school districts uh, in the north or someplace or even in other places in the south, that there were counties, uh, school districts in Florida who they could uh, well take uh, uh, a lesson from in terms of how to really desegregate the schools. I had the privilege of appointing George Edgecombe as the first black. I had the privilege of appointing Gwen Young as the first female, one of many. When uh, EJ says that he's going to uh, hire George, he called me and said, I need to talk. And uh, I want you to go to talk to Judge Burnside with me because Dur uh, Dermot said, if you put that nigga in my courtroom, I'm dismissing every indictment and every information. My mentor was George Edgecombe, who was um, a felony division chief. And um, I worked directly under his supervision, and uh, he was a wonderful man, a great teacher, um, and only um, reinforced my um, respect for African Americans. Him being my mentor, he was also uh, an adversary in the courtroom, and, um, and then later he was a judge before whom I appeared. Um, but um, George uh, would have, he commanded respect, and uh, he's not a person that, certainly in the legal environment, would have tolerated being discriminated against. George Edgecombe had uh, been the first uh, minority, first black uh, judge on the bench here in Hillsborough County. He'd done a wonderful job. And he was recognized by all as uh, uh, being an outstanding judge. And um, as I recall, he had viral leukemia. And uh, after he was diagnosed, um, 
it, it, it wasn't very long that he passed away. Well, law school, the, in terms of diversity, was more of the, the, the female phenomenon was more uh, the topic of the day. Um, I'm, um, uh, there, there were probably fewer than 10 females in law school when I was there. I ended up marrying one of them. The women uh, had started to gain ground by the time I came into law school in 1984 and probably accounted for almost half of the law school class, if not just shy of half of the law school class. And so from the female side, we were really starting to make some gains. As the number of women in law school rose, I think, and women did so well academically, big firms started hiring women because they were looking for the best students in the in the class. And so it wasn't just Carlton Fields and, and to some degree and, uh, and Holland and Knight, it was everybody. Because I went to, can remember going to one firm in town that no longer is uh, exist where I interviewed with a number of different people and one of my friends who was a young lawyer at the firm basically told me if you'd been a guy you'd have been offered a job before you walked out the door but because I was female I was not offered a job. My first legal job was um, as a law clerk for Judge Joseph Hatchett who was on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit at that time and that would have been in 1987. And I recall going to his chambers um, probably mid-afternoon one day, um, three o'clock or so, and we ended up staying there until around eight o'clock at night. And just share with me his life story about how he got where he was. And as a result of meeting him and just observing his professionalism, dignity, um, integrity, um, I decided at that moment that I wanted to work for him. I can tell you honestly, there were some environments where we weren't welcome. I, in fact, had an interview with a firm in Tampa, and after the interview was over, I didn't get the job. And years later, one of their partners came up to me and told me that he was sorry that the firm had not hired me, but the firm just wasn't ready to make that move at that time. When Mary joined uh, Carlton Fields in 1987, she was probably the first or second black female lawyer at a major law firm in Tampa, period. When I first went to Carlton Fields, I kind of fell under the wings of Bob Pass. He was the lawyer who had been assigned to all of the failed banking litigation, and he took me in as one of the young associates on all of those cases. And so he became an instant mentor to me. And then there were people like Reese Smith and Gwen Young and Sylvia Walbold and Chris Catrullis who all sort of helped form me as a young lawyer. Uh, and primarily it's because they just gave me work to do like they gave everybody else work to do. And they expected no less from me or more from me than they expected of my other colleagues. And um, I think if any young lawyer is going to be successful at a firm, it's because they have ombudsmen who will help to mentor them, help to ensure that they have a steady stream of work to do, that it's quality work, and that they give them really, really strong uh, criticism to help them grow. And I found that uh, in my Carlton Fields uh, family. I believe that you know, we've certainly made tremendous progress in terms of the number of women and minorities in the judiciary. Uh, and, you know, when you realize that Susan Bucklew was the first female judge, and that was, what, in 1982 or 83, uh, and, you know, we now have a significant number of, of female judges uh, here in Hillsborough County. George Edgecombe was the first African-American uh, judge, and that was in the uh, 70s, uh, and we now have a, a, a significantly larger number of African American judges. So I would think just right off the bat that I think our judiciary is probably a, a place where we've seen uh, more in, improvement in, in diversity. I think some of the stalwart lawyers in town served as sounding boards for us also. People like Dell Stewart and Arthenia Joyner who had been in this community for a very long time. When I first met both of them, they'll laugh at this. I thought there was something wrong with them. You know, what, why are they so strident? 
what is it with them? I was a young lawyer. I was rel relatively naive uh, concerning matters of race and barriers. Um, and I learned very quickly that they were wise and they had been in this community for a very long time and understood the sort of barriers that I would face as a young lawyer, just developing as a lawyer and overcoming some of the limitations uh, that I would encounter as an African American. Athena Joyner, my law partner, who is a black female, who when she forgot, she had finished school early and, and I gave her an opportunity to work. And uh, when I nominated her to be the president of Florida Black Lawyers, and that was all this bombastic and caustic rhetoric about, uh, she's female. And I wrote my famous, they call it the Sesquipedalian letter. That's, that's how I ended it, because I said, I can't believe you who are in the forefront of civil rights and talking about what's done to you because you're black cannot discern the difference that sexism is equally as ominous as racism. I hope I need no further sesquipedalian diatribes to explain this away. Dale, so uh, I have this feeling of call me Mr. Sesquipedalian. But, so the struggle is not only for you. You have to broaden your scope and, and realize that the people will utilize their power unfairly. It was not until 1972 that the Hillsborough Bar Association accepted a change in their charter from whites only. So the lawyers, that, the black lawyers that we had, such as Delano Stewart, Warren um, Dawson, uh, Arthenia Joyner, George Edgecombe, who we honor his memory uh, with our Hillsborough County Courthouse, they could not be members of our Bar Association because they were black. I integrated my practice in 1970, and I integrated you can't whip everybody with a whip. Integrate this, integrate that, and then you don't do anything. So I said, let me get ahead of the game. And I found a person, a friend of mine. She's still on the City Council of Atlanta, Emma Donnell. I said, find me in your travel a young white boy who will be willing to sacrifice. And found Martin Lawyer, who joined me the year he got out of Vanderbilt. And he was criticized. You went to Brown? And you went to Vanderbilt, and you out there on 29th in the ghetto with that. You know, I don't know what they all they call, but and we stayed together. We've been friends. His uh, son tutored my baby girl in Maya. So, so that is goodness when you try to find it. Women were excluded from law school. Women were discouraged from studying law. Women had to go out of state to study to be uh, lawyers. But if they became members of the bar, if they were white, they could be members of the Hillsborough Bar Association, but not if they were black. And that changed in 1972. The Bar Association in Hillsborough County um, was um, uh, planning to establish a legal services program. And here was a, one of the first efforts I think by the Hillsborough County Bar Association to reach out into the um, into the black community. This was a very controversial program at that time. Um, there were those who felt that this was certainly nothing that the federal government should get into. Uh, they saw that um, establishing a program uh, in which they were paid lawyers to represent the indigent was a um, slippery slope to socialism, to socialized law. The Hillsborough Bar Association has a very, very um, um, wonderful history. But I think in the last 50 years, the Hillsborough County Bar has become a leading, shining example of how diversity and, uh, and uh, tolerance uh, and service to the bar. And I think we have much to be uh, grateful and much to be uh, applauded because the Hillsborough County Bar is an example to bars throughout the nation. 
I think that after that the Equal Rights Amendment didn't pass, it's like everything else. I think people start to look at other ways that they can promote uh, equal rights for uh, women and continuing to look at uh, you know anti-discrimination laws, uh, to look at working within organizations to get women involved. And I, I think that you know women have certainly moved forward significantly. Yes, we had a few women that were members of the Florida Bar. They were not trial lawyers. They stayed primarily in their law firms. They were specialists in probate. They did a lot of title search in real estate matters, etc. But I had the privilege of appointing Gwen Young as the first female a prosecuting attorney in the history of Hillsborough County shortly after she graduated from the University of Florida. She had graduated from uh, Duke University, excellent credentials, and, uh, and I appointed her and a lot of other women followed uh, in her footsteps. She became an outstanding trial attorney and I will be very proud uh, shortly when she becomes the president of the Florida Bar. Where do I think we've made the most progress in Tampa in achieving diversity? I don't think we've made a lot of progress. We've made some progress. Now keep in mind, when I came to Tampa back in 1988, there were only three lawyers in what I refer to as majority firms. We have several now. I don't know the exact number, but it may be in the range of between 20 and 30. Uh, lawyers um, in majority firms, but when I look at the number of lawyers that have left those firms or the number of lawyers that have progressed to partner and stayed at those firms, that's a dismal picture. That hasn't changed much. And I think as we sit here today, there are probably less than a handful of lawyers uh, that are African American and that are partners at majority firms. And so I think a lot of firms have done a great job of hiring, but I think the retention records are pretty woeful. Despite the level of achievement we've attained in diversifying, for example, the federal bench and uh, having lawyers of color in major law firms around the city, I think there's still work to be done. I think that the bar uh, could see some more diversity. If you look around major law firms in Tampa, there still aren't um, large numbers of African-American partners in major firms or African-American partners serving as CEOs and CFOs or general counsel of uh, major law firms. And there still uh, aren't that many African-American uh, judges. In fact, I think we may have lost ground in the state court in terms of the number of African-American judges with some of the uh, recent retirements. You, uh, I, I mean, you have to find some levity in life. As, as hard as you fight, you can't be too serious about it. You know? I mean, you can't be over serious and you don't give people a right to change because we all are, in a sense, uh, sort of uh, cloaked by our experiences. And you cannot know what you have not been exposed to. And the more you read, the more you train, the more you travel, the more you see, the broader you become. I think those who have made the most progress in terms of equal opportunity and treatment during uh, my career here have been women, black adults. I believe it was Mark Twain that said that uh, travel is fatal to prejudice and bigotry. And so I think a lot of times we don't travel enough. And a lot of times we misunderstand each other is because we just haven't walked in each other's shoes. For me, making the decision to come back and practice law in Tampa was a good one. I think that, the, frankly, the legal community has been very uh, 
receptive to me and I think there's a lot of opportunity in, in Tampa and uh, hopefully things will uh, you know, continue to improve. Certainly coming from the time when I started when you could count the number of women lawyers on your hand to now being in a situation where 35% of the members of the Florida Bar are women, we've come a long way. I think real change in diversity is going to come from the heart. Um, and I think that interestingly, the places I've found sort of engines of change to be are in our elementary and high schools and middle schools, becoming friends of my children's uh, friends' parents is what's brought me into a broader community. Serving in service organizations that are not related to law, I think is what starts to make people see each other as friends and colleagues and individuals and not as an African-American judge or as an African-American lawyer. As I tell my children about life, what one does with weeds is you kill them. And you pull them out and you throw them aside. But with flowers, you cultivate them and you grow them. And the more flowers you grow, the more beautiful life is. And that's what I always do. Recognizing that you will have weeds in your garden, you pull them out, but you don't let that become what you concentrate on. You concentrate on the flowers. We may never root out totally the notions of racial bias, uh, but as long as we are committed daily uh, to making sure uh, that uh, we make progress toward that goal, uh, I think we're, I think we're in good company, and I think we're moving in the right direction. I had an experience with Mr. Hoover personally. I was invited to um, receive the personal commendations of the director of the FBI, and uh, in his private office, we exchanged um, greetings, etc. He commended me for the work that I was doing for the Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Justice Department and the successes that I had had as an assistant federal prosecutor, etc. And then um, he uh, made a comment, he says, I know how proud you are of your Spanish uh, heritage. Obviously, he had me investigated and checked out before he met with me, and then he tells me, the Spaniards, have nev the Spaniards in this country have never contributed to the criminal index of this nation. It took me a while to focus what is he telling me um, they have never contributed to the criminal index of this nation. Then I realized he's saying they were hardworking people, they were not uh, of, uh, violating the law, etc. And then out of nowhere, he then jumps in and he says, Mr. Salcinas, Martin Luther King is a liar, a liar. I'm not there to talk about Martin Luther King or the civil no, rights. I'm there because I'm winning his cases and he's proud and he's congratulating me and then strokes me by telling me how proud you are of your Spanish heritage, the Spaniards, are, and then goes into a tirade. Martin Luther King is a liar, Mr. Salcinas. And I remember it, I'm listening to it in that tone. A liar, Mr. Salcinas, a liar. All right, I, my Later, we have found out that uh, the director had ordered uh, Martin Luther King to be under surveillance, etc. So he was compulsive about Martin Luther King at that time. Mm -hmm.